is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Russia's invasion of Ukraine enters its seventh day. The Russians claim to have taken Kherson, the first city to fall to Moscow. Our other headlines, Russian diplomats say they're ready to hold a second round of peace talks and Ukraine has confirmed their delegation will also participate. The United Nations says more than 800,000 people have fled the fighting in Ukraine. We'll be reporting on Europe's new refugee crisis. What we have seen already uh, from Vladimir Putin's regime, uh, in my view, already fully qualifies as, as, as a war crime. Uh, yes, Mr. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson tells the House of Commons Putin's invasion of Ukraine is illegal under international law. Heavy bombardment by Russian military forces has continued across Ukraine as the conflict in the country enters its seventh day. As many as 2,000 Ukrainians are now reported to have been killed so far. Russia claims to have captured the port city of Kherson in southern Ukraine. Authorities have confirmed they are surrounded on all sides but say fighting continues. Russian shells are falling on the capital with the destruction of this apartment block to the northwest of Kiev. The mayor says the population is preparing to defend itself from an onslaught. The Ukrainian president has appealed to the West to enforce a no-fly zone over his country. Vladimir Zelensky has urged NATO to prevent genocide by Russia. Well, the Kremlin says Russia is ready to hold a second round of talks with Ukraine in neighboring Belarus after a meeting on Monday failed to produce any kind of breakthrough. Uh, let's talk to our correspondent Ryan Thompson on the Polish border who's following the progress of uh, any peace negotiations such as they are. So, Ryan, these talks look like they're now going ahead with some to attend. Yeah, that's right, Jamie. It was looking pretty so-so this morning. We weren't even sure if it would be here or what the exact deal of it would be. Now we have confirmation from both sides. The Russians, who sent their confirmation earlier this morning that their representatives would be there, regardless if the Ukrainians showed up. And then just a little bit later in the day, we heard from the Ukrainian delegation that they would be sending representatives as well. CGTN sources tell us that just a little bit uh, farther from here, 11 kilometers down the road from this border point in Belarus, in the city of Brest, is likely to be the venue for this. Belarusian authorities have said time and time again that they are prepared to be the mediator between the two sides, bring the two chairs to the table uh, whenever a moment's notice is given, though we've seen some pushback, at least on the Ukrainian side, and even from some Belarusians who were here today protesting uh, against their opposition, saying that the uh, Belarusian leader, Alexander Lukashenko, is not an impartial voice here. They would clearly like to see that more is being done to ensure that they don't have this presence, don't have this involvement uh, in the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Take a listen to some of the protesters. First of all, I have a lot of friends in Ukraine, so I can't watch what is happening and not do anything. Secondly, Belarus is also participating in this war, so I want to show that Belarus is standing with Ukraine. Ukrainians are our brothers, and Ukraine is fighting against darkness. They are fighting against neo-fascism, and Putin and Lukashenko are its leaders. All of the progressive world, and especially Belarusians, must support Ukraine, because it is our hope and we will help them however we can. And Jamie, the question remains, will it be Brest or will it be another city along the border within Belarus? Uh, it's not really clear at this point. Of course, the delegations are probably le confirming this detail last minute. But there have been calls for the talks to be held in other locations that would potentially be more impartial, whether that be Switzerland or Turkey or even some have floated Poland as an alternative location. Uh, out here at the protest earlier, I was speaking to an exiled Belarusian minister who was really saying that Alexander Lukashenko is not the man to be... 
hosting these talks in his country because he just has too much to gain by uh, any, uh, uh, any secession of rights or of issues to the Russians here. Ryan, thanks for that. Ryan Thompson, our correspondent on the Polish border. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Nawid Jabakal, who is in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. So, Nawid, while these peace talks now do look to be on, the reported Russian advances continue. Yeah, that's right, Robert. We were set to talk a short while ago, uh, preparing to talk to you from our outside location. But uh, once again, for the second time today, the air raid sirens went off in Lviv. That means look for cover, look for protection, look for shelter. That's why we're currently here in the basement. So uh, the connection a bit patchy and the sound a bit echoey. Uh, but this is a daily occurrence now. This is a daily part of life for many people all across Ukraine, some able to head to places like this but the large majority uh, won't be able to. And uh, what we're seeing now is as the violence continues to escalate, particularly moving to cities and urban areas, the risk of civilian casualties is growing by the minute. Let me talk through some of the key points in the country. Down in the south, uh, Russia says it's taken its first city, Kherson. Uh, the Ukrainians say that's simply not true. They're putting up a strong resistance and fighting back Russian troops. Uh, very strategically important location, Kherson. It's just above Crimea, a port city as well. Um, but further north on the Russian border, Kharkiv, the second biggest city in Ukraine, home to one and a half million people. Uh, there's heavy fighting there as well. The Ukrainian side says dozens of people have been killed in Russian artillery strikes there, uh, an aerial bombardment, although the Russians see the picture very, very different, staying a lot more tight-lipped about casualty figures and numbers. And then uh, Kiev as well, uh, the capital, uh, there's aerial bombardment uh, being reported there still as well. Last night, uh, two TV stations were hit with reports of civilian deaths. Now, uh, uh, it's important to highlight that uh, both sides are painting a very different picture here. According to the Ukrainian government, the civilian uh, uh, loss of life is mounting. More than 2,000 people have been killed, they say, because of Russia's actions. Russia says that's simply not true. It's not targeting civilian uh, uh, locations at all, and it's focusing rather on military uh, assets, on military bases, on strategic locations to try uh, and push back the Ukrainian army. But what this is doing is really causing a lot of anguish, a lot of concern, a lot of desperation for people all across Ukraine. Anna Weed, you mentioned those Russian claims that only non-civilian targets are being hit. Yeah, um, and uh, this is something that uh, Moscow is sticking with, and I think that's going to be a key talking point when these talks, the second round of negotiations, go ahead, uh, if they do go ahead in the next few hours. What the Ukrainian side wants is absolutely crystal clear. They want a ceasefire first and foremost, and they want Russian troops to withdraw from Ukrainian territory. Now, that second point, I think, is going to be a bit more difficult, uh, but the first one, uh, the, the ceasefire, is something they're desperately looking for. Uh, Russia's power, militarily at least, if you look at the plain hard facts, uh, is uh, significantly much larger than Ukraine. Uh, the US and its uh, Ukraine's Western allies, uh, NATO allies, the European Union, the UK as well, saying that they're going to continue defending uh, Ukraine's sovereignty. They're going to continue offering weapons to push back. And it is making a big difference. Make no mistake about that. The fact that this is a week into the war now and no major city has fallen, arguably, uh, that's because of the, the the support that the Ukrainians are getting. But as I said, uh, Kharkiv, one and a half million people, Kiev, a city of three million people, and uh, Kherson, just uh, uh, another smaller city relatively, but still 130,000 people. If Russia continues to move in uh, and say that it wants to try and take these uh, strategic locations, which is a, a key part of its, uh, of its uh, military plan, you'd think, uh, particularly with Kiev, then the likelihood is that civilian casualties may continue to rise. Young and old, this war is impacting people of all ages. They're coming in droves to Lviv, where the finish line is in sight. It's mostly women and children allowed to leave, but so many face tragic decisions. Because of his three young children, Valentin can go, but wonders whether he should stay and fight. Yeah, I want to save my family and uh, go in any way in Europe. Uh, I want uh, my family live. I must uh, save my family. 
Around a week into this war and already more than 350,000 people have crossed into Poland from Ukraine. For those with no other mode of transport, these trains are proving an absolute lifeline. As you can see, many have already taken perilous journeys to get this far and are looking to try and make that final trip about 60 kilometers west to the safety of the EU. It's not just Ukrainians trying to flee. On one train, we found a group of African students. They came here searching for a better future. Now they're desperate to leave. How was the journey from Kiev? Stressful. Very stressful. stressful because it's not all about uh, the stressfulness. It's all about traveling and you are also scared because you don't know what is going to happen. So it's not fair because we all have the same life others have to. And do you think your chances will be less because of the color of your skin? Yeah, definitely. 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 Others are joining the war efforts in any way they can. Volunteers hand out hot drinks and food for the wary a moment of respite amid the panic and uncertainty. People are quite stoic, I would say. Well, some people, of course, are more worrisome than the others, and I, I do my best to kind of calm them down a little bit. As the conflict moves into cities, the exodus will almost certainly worsen. But resisting Russia is an all-too-familiar feeling for some Ukrainians. On the edge of safety, Natalia is a rarity here. She's waiting with her 14-year-old son for a train going in the other direction, to Dnipro, to possible shelling, to war. We will live at home because our relatives are there. My mom, my grandpa, my husband was buried in my hometown a year ago. It's very important to be near him and take care of his grave. Like so many Ukrainians we speak to, her bravery may be masking real fear. The UN says millions more will flee if the conflict continues, even if that means leaving so much behind. Norwegian Barkil, CGTN, Lviv. So what's the view from Russia? Let's talk now to our correspondent, Giles Gibson, who is in Moscow. Uh, so Giles, what's the Kremlin saying about this apparent advances of Russian troops? Well, the Russian authorities are being extremely tight-lipped about the movements of Russian troops inside Ukraine. Uh, we are seeing Russian officials, state-controlled TV here in Russia, really sticking to this narrative that this is a special military operation that this is not an invasion, that is not a word that you are seeing on state-controlled TV here. Uh, we're also seeing the authorities uh, targeting a couple of independent media channels who've not been prepared to stick to that carefully prepared narrative from the Kremlin. Uh, a very well-known radio station here uh, known as Echo of Moscow, uh, that has been taken off the airwaves, although it can still uh, broadcast through some of its online platforms such as YouTube. Uh, and there's also another channel, another independent channel, uh, known as TV Rain. That had actually previously been taken off the airwaves by the authorities, uh, and we are now seeing its website, its online platform, blocked as well. Uh, plus, just in the last hour or two, we've heard from its editor-in-chief saying that he has decided to leave the country, to leave Russia, although he st will still keep trying uh, to keep his uh, platform alive from outside of the country's borders. So Ukraine claims that the number of Russian dead could exceed 5,000 and that some Russian units have deserted. Is this being reported in Russian media? Well, the Russian Ministry of Defense has publicly acknowledged that there have been some casualties on the Russian side during the fighting in Ukraine, but they have absolutely not given us any sort of a breakdown about uh, the numbers of wounded or potentially the numbers uh, of Russian soldiers who've been killed inside the country. Uh, we have, though, had a few numbers from uh, the leader of the province of Chechnya, uh, Raza, Razam, uh, excuse me, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov. Uh, he has said that two Chechen soldiers have been killed and six have been wounded. But clearly, uh, the numbers that we are hearing from the Ukrainian government, from Ukrainian officials, uh, are just so much larger than anything uh, that the Kremlin are acknowledging so far. Meanwhile, Giles, there has been a stark warning from the Russian foreign minister if the conflict in Ukraine escalates. 
Yeah, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, saying that if there is a third world war, that it would involve nuclear weapons. Of course, earlier in the week, we heard from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, he appeared on state TV here in Russia, telling his defense minister to put the country's nuclear deterrent on high alert. So really what we're seeing uh, is this incredibly strong rhetoric coming out of the Kremlin, coming out of senior Russian officials, even as, as we were just hearing from Ryan just a few minutes ago, the Russians are saying that they are open to talks, open to diplomacy. Giles Gibson in Moscow, thank you very much. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, oil prices continue to surge over the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but the oil cartel OPEC decides not to increase production. Now, from what we're hearing, definitely hear those air raid sirens in the background again, which means we might have to head inside at some point. We're hearing that a number of uh, points of military infrastructure in Ukraine. Сейчас съемочная группа находится в больнице Петровского района Донецка. We're seeing people with suitcases scurrying about, but getting out to where? They're not quite sure. проехали, пробовали пути. Пока ехали. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. The world has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. Uh, oil prices continue to surge over supply fears and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Despite soaring demand, the oil cartel OPEC and its allies, including Russia, have decided not to increase production. The group has just held its shortest meeting on court and made no mention of Ukraine. Let's talk now to our correspondent Johannes Fleschberger in Vienna. So, Johannes, oil now trading at around $110 a barrel. What did OPEC say? Well, as you've mentioned, OPEC did not say anything about Ukraine. They did not even mention the word, according to some sources. All they've said is that there are geopolitical situations to consider. Um, but we know that there are two major problems for oil consumers and oil buyers. One is that despite the, so far there haven't been any direct uh, sanctions against Russian oil companies, the markets are fearful. They do not want to buy Russian oil and th thus uh, there is a short of supply and high oil prices. On the other hand, we have oil buyers, especially in Europe, that are facing problems with shipping because uh, freight rates across the Black Sea and the Mediterranean are uh, very high most recently and uh, this causes problems uh, as we know and there is one uh, 
one country that actually profits right now or that can profit from the situation is Saudi Arabia, uh, which is exporting a lot of oil and producing a lot of oil right now, especially to Asian markets, and they can profit from this, these high margins because of the high oil prices. And Johannes, the UN's nuclear watchdog is also holding emergency talks on Ukraine. What can you tell us about those? Well, this board meeting uh, will continue likely also tomorrow when a resolution should be uh, published, should be voted on. Um, a first draft has shown that this resolution by the UN's watchdog IEA condemns uh, Russia fiercely against Russia's attacks, they say. But uh, according to some sources, this first draft will be watered down in order to uh, get approval by all 35 members. Um, we do know that uh, IEA's uh, um, Secretary General Mario uh, Grossi said that he is having close contact both with Ukraine as well as Russia. Uh, he's talking to both sides in order to uh, ensure safety at all nuclear, at all 15 uh, nuclear reactors in Ukraine. Uh, we do know that uh, Russian troops have already occupied the area around the formal power nuclear power plant Chernobyl. And we also know, uh, according at least the Russian troops that they have also uh, occupied the area around uh, Europe's largest atomic uh, nuclear energy plant uh, in uh, Saporizhia. and uh, but we don't, do not know yet for sure if they also control the stuff inside the nuclear plant. According to the Secretary General of the IAEA, um, he is even considering sending IEA staff to Ukraine in order to ensure safety. Johannes, thank you. Johannes Fleschberger there in Vienna. Well, the Ukraine invasion is continuing to cause turmoil in global markets. Let's talk to our correspondent, Juliet Mann, who's been watching for us. Uh, what's going on? The put is in the green. U.S. markets look that they're going to be recovering throughout the, the rest of the trading day. Um, the, the big theme, though, of course, across financial markets is volatility. And much of that is because of energy markets. You know, are we going to see um, a ban on Russian imports of oil and gas? Or will Russia um, cut their exports? Or maybe there'll be a big disruption to supply from Ukraine. Maybe there'll be some you know, pipeline damage or something like that. So lots of maybes here. So you've talked about oil already, more than $110 a barrel. But natural gas prices too, they are soaring. The um, UK wholesale gas price up 34 and that is even well. There's been no serious disruption, at least not yet, um, to, to supply. So retail investors, well, amidst all of this market turmoil, they're bargain hunting. Um, it really, there's been a lot, a lot of aggressive buying, um, with an average of $1.2 billion worth of equities being snapped up every single day. And what are they buying? Well, it's the tech stocks. So Tesla, that's top of the list, followed by Apple, Meta, Microsoft, and then chipmaker NVIDIA. That's number five in the list of um, the top stocks um, um, of, the, um, of the week. And investors, we've also seen this massive, massive buying of U U.S. securities. Um, the biggest since last November, um, $1.9 billion worth. So they're really, really getting in there. And of course, this always happens during times of uncertainty. Investors pile into gold. Um, gold is now $1,929 per ounce. Bear in mind that before this crisis, it was sort of hovering around $1,800 an ounce, and it hadn't really moved since the end of 2020. Uh, also want to mention cryptocurrencies because that, that's really interesting here. The conflict's really boosting Bitcoin because that's maybe a way for Russians and oligarchs to get their funds out. So this crypto space, perhaps drawing capital away from gold, although, of course, there's a lot of regulatory pressure there, too. We're going to explore the whole issue surrounding cryptocurrency yeah. in just a moment. But I, I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, more and more global companies distancing themselves now from Russia. Oh, so many of the world's top companies now, yes, are disentangling themselves from business. It's this wave of blue chip companies who are leaving, which comes on top of all of those sanctions which are designed to freeze Russian banks out of the financial system. The big one is Apple. They're not selling anything now. All product sales halted. Um, in Russia. Nike, um, they, they've stopped online sales in Russia. We're not sure if that's more about deliveries, but still, it's a big brand. And Google has removed um, Russian state-funded publishers, such as RT. Airbus has pulled out of Russia. Rival Boeing did the same. We already knew about them. And we talked about a lot of the car companies, Volvo, Jaguar, General Motors. 
motorcycle firm Harley Davidson, they have shut off their exports to Russia. And then we've got all the logistic suppliers. You're not going to get any deliveries from FedEx or UPS if you're in Russia. HSBC, the UK's largest lender, they've said they're ending relations with um, several Russian banks, including Russia's number two lender, VTB. Of course, they're one of the banks that have got these huge sanctions um, on them too. There are some standouts, though, who are doing things differently. So French energy firm Total, they said they are going to continue doing business with Russia, although they're not going to invest in any new projects. Remember, Shell, BP, they've exited Russia entirely. And I'm also going to mention Glencore, that's the miner. Um, they said they are keeping their stakes in the Moscow energy firms N Plus and Rosneft, although they did say that those holdings could come under review. Juliet, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's explore those issues surrounding cryptocurrencies now. And Russian households and businesses have rushed to convert their tumbling currency, the ruble, into foreign money and assets. There are signs that many have been turning to cryptocurrencies to protect their savings and sidestep foreign sanctions. Well, let's talk now to Matty Greenspan, who's the founder of Quantum Economics and the co-author of The Complete Guide to Fintech Trading and Investments. Great to have you with us today. So uh, is cryptocurrency a viable option for Russia to evade the sanctions now in place? Well, well not entirely. I don't believe that it's liquid enough. Certainly, it had this... Uh, happened in five or ten years from now, uh, they probably could have just moved their entire economy over quite seamlessly. However, the infrastructure is certainly not in place. Um, however, uh, the thing to note here is that both uh, Ukraine and Russia, over the course of the last month, uh, even as the conflict was escalating and before the invasion, just before the invasion actually happened, both have made moves to legalize uh, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies on paper. Russia recognizing it as a foreign currency. They understand that their citizens are using it anyways, and they'd rather them reporting home to the government about it. Uh, Ukraine has seen a huge uh, uplift in uh, cryptocurrency even before the conflict. Um, basically, what we're talking about with uh, Russia being cut out of SWIFT is significant. And um, this actually highlights um, some of the key flaws in uh, the, the traditional financial system, which is that, uh, you know, a government can, uh, whether you're innocent or guilty, supportive of a war or not supportive of a war, um, the government has the flip switch on whether or not you are able to access your own money. Uh, we saw during the Canadian protests, uh, the Canadian government uh, declaring a state of emergency and freezing transactions of people who were suspected of, suspected of donating to the trucker movement. And this economic, economic warfare actually proved extremely effective against their own citizens. And uh, now we see, obviously, the world taking note of that. And uh, very likely, uh, governments and, and uh, financial institutions will seek to exercise this power uh, over people uh, and their money uh, more frequently, depending on whatever narrative or, you know, is happening in the news at the moment, be it COVID or uh, a war. Um, and this is basically what Bitcoin was created uh, for. This is, this is it, is to facilitate transactions that don't require um, a government or a bank to facilitate, and no government or bank can actually stop. So uh, whether or, or not we're seeing, you know, in the last few days any kind of uplift, which we are, uh, as exchanges are actually reporting, um, both from Russia and Ukraine, higher trading volumes. Um, but to me, this is really about the long term. Essentially, millions of people have just been cut off from the uh, traditional financial system. Um, and uh, certainly, they're going to look to buy U.S. dollars or Bitcoin or whatever else they can get their hands of in order to escape their sinking home currency. Okay, Matty Greenspan, founder of Quantum Economics. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, Britain's Prime Minister accuses Russia's president of war crimes in Ukraine. It is now important that all of us in Europe act very swiftly. Fines for the non-vaccinated will most likely be between $1,000 and $4,000. The new Omicron variant circulating in Southern Africa. 
The financial markets have also reacted badly to the news. Growing dissatisfaction with the way the Dutch government is handling the pandemic. Cancelling the city's main public Christmas markets for the second year in a row. Protests and riots by those opposed to restrictions and vaccinations. There is no room for complacency in this ongoing battle against COVID. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with global business, only on CGTS. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Russia's invasion of Ukraine enters its seventh day. The Russians claim to have taken Kherson, the first city, to fall to Moscow. And Russian diplomats say they're ready to hold a second round of peace talks. And Ukraine confirms their delegation will participate. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has called Russian President Vladimir Putin a war criminal for targeting civilians in Ukraine. At a packed House of Commons, Johnson called for Putin to be prosecuted. What we have seen already uh, from Vladimir Putin's regime in the use of the munitions that they have already been, uh, been dropping on, as, on innocent civilians, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in my view, already fully qualifies as, as, as a war crime. And I know that the, uh, that the ICC prosecutor is already investigating, and I'm sure the whole House uh, will support that. The Prime Minister came under pressure to impose more sanctions on Russian oligarchs who own expensive properties in the UK. He declined to comment on whether Chelsea football club owner Roman Abramovich would be targeted, but said the vice was tightening around Putin. Ukraine's ambassador was watching from the public gallery and received a rare standing ovation. Well, the United Nations General Assembly is set to reprimand Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. A vote is due shortly, where the UN is expected to demand Moscow stop fighting and withdraw its forces. This all comes after a similar resolution that the United Nations Security Council was vetoed by Russia last week. Well, let's talk to our correspondent John Terrett, watching events for us in New York. Um, John, is this vote going to pass, and if so, how easily? Well, it's kind of difficult to say at the moment. I will tell you it's all happening here in New York right at this very minute in the hall of the General Assembly at the United Nations. They come to the culmination of what turned out to be a two-and-a-half-day meeting, an emergency session of the General Assembly, only the 11th emergency session of the General Assembly in the United Nations' entire more than 70-year history. 193 member countries were given the chance to have a say on what is happening in Ukraine. More than 100 did, and 
I have to tell you, dozens of countries, it seems to me, have either not got involved in this process or are likely to abstain today. They're drawing up a non-binding resolution which basically deplores Russia's aggression against Ukraine and calls on Russia to immediately, completely and unconditionally withdraw all military forces from Ukraine. Now, this morning we've heard from about 10 or 11 speakers, and I want to draw your attention, I think, to two. First of all, the ambassador from Belarus, Valentin Rybakov, spoke within the last hour. Now, this is important because Belarus, a neighbor of Ukraine, neighbor of Russia, is thought by many to be involved in the fighting in Ukraine, something that the ambassador denied this morning. But let me tell you basically what he said. He said that Belarus will vote against the draft resolution, which is now being voted on in the General Assembly Hall. He blamed Ukraine for not abiding by the Minsk Agreement of 2014. And he said that in the last seven years or so, people in the Donbass and the Luhansk region have been subjected to violence, which has been perpetrated by the Ukrainians. And then he turned to the General Assembly Hall and he looked everybody in the eye and he said, where were you all, ladies and gentlemen? when that was going on. And he rejected the fact that Belarus is accused of being involved in the fighting, and he said far from it. The president, Alexander Lukashenko, is actually heavily involved in trying to bring the two sides together. And then we heard from Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who is the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Now, she's had a very busy 24 hours. She was in Washington, D.C. last night for the State of the Union. She made it back here. She was wearing a blue scarf with a yellow shirt. And her main points were that the U.S. calls on Russia to stop the war immediately, to respect the sovereignty of Ukraine, and calling on Belarus to stop supporting Russia. She said this war is one man's choice, and that's the choice of President Putin. Let's hear more of what Linda Thomas-Greenfield had to say. Today we call on Russia to stop its unprovoked, unjustified, unconscionable war. We call on Russia to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And today, we stand together in holding Russia accountable for its violations of international law and to address the horrific human rights and humanitarian crisis unfolding before our eyes. Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, speaking just a few minutes ago. I see from my monitor now that the Russian Federation Ambassador is speaking at the moment at the conclusion of all this, while the voting is going on and before the result of that is announced. I should point out very briefly that this is a resolution drawn up within the General Assembly. It is non-binding, but it will have sent a very harsh political message to President Putin that the world is against him for what he's done in Ukraine, assuming it passes with more than the two-thirds majority needed. We've just heard from the Ukrainian ambassador, who is Sergei Kislitsa. He essentially wrapped up the whole two-and-a-half-day event with these words. We are living through a defining moment for our generation. Our generation is the generation that was supposed by our predecessors to be saved from scourge of war. That is why our predecessors created the United Nations. And yet today it falls to us to save future generations. That's the Ukrainian ambassador speaking to the United Nations. Uh, John, thank you for that. Our correspondent, John Tarrant, watching events for us at the United Nations in New York. And while the international community condemns Russia with its words, on the ground in Ukraine, the military offensive continues. Inna Sovson is an opposition member of Ukraine's parliament. She is still in the capital, Kiev.
Now I'm not fluent in Russian, so it just take me out of my native city. Uh, so yes, as a member of parliament, uh, as the majority of the parliamentarians, uh, I am staying in Kyiv. Some MPs did go to, back to their constituencies. Uh, uh, some MPs did uh, rejoin the army, like uh, my best, best friend in the parliament, member of parliament, Roman Kostenko, he was from the special forces. He rejoined the army and he went to fight to the south of Ukraine. But yeah, of course I'm in Kyiv and I'm staying here where my people are. And what's the mood like now, seven days in? Has it changed? I think the first uh, two days of panic and, and scare have uh, changed into this extreme level of determination to win. And what I'm seeing on uh, on everybody's side, everyone just found the ways to be useful in this war. Of course, the, the, the major job is being done by the Ukrainian army with the support of the National Guard and the uh, volunteer territorial defense units. So over 100,000 people, Ukrainians, just regular folks who have nothing to do with the military, with the army, uh, they just signed up for volunteer defense of the territories. Uh, but then other people who don't really have much of the military background to practice, uh, they're doing something else. So like we are seeing people uh, supporting our army with food. We are seeing people coordinating humanitarian efforts, uh, providing medicines and so on and so forth. So as of now, I think the general feeling is this. We are extremely angry. We are extremely, extremely uh, determined to win. And this is the feeling that is actually supported by what we are seeing on the ground, because uh, despite uh, what Russians are claiming, despite their strategy that they will take over Kyiv in 24 hours after the first bombings over the city, they actually failed to do so. And actually, the city does feel very well protected as of now, apart from for, for the, um, the bombardment from the air. But again, their, their missiles do not seem to hit the city to an extent that they wanted to. Unlike, and that it pains me to say, unlike my native city of Kharkiv, which is being bombed for three nights, uh, three days in a row right now, um, it's my native city. I'm seeing bombs blowing up uh, like five minutes walk from, from my school. I'm seeing the area where I grew up being bombarded from air, and that is just um, extremely painful for me to watch. And I'm getting messages from people back home in Kharkiv, and they're all actually the same. They're all saying, like, we hope this fascist Putin will die and suffer, and we want to make sure that we fight back and we will we will win. That is the general message, even from people in Kharkiv who are hiding in shelters and bunkers for over 72 hours now. And when it comes to staying safe, uh, what are you doing personally? Do you have a safe place, a place in a shelter? So it's like that the very first day of the war, I was uh, invited by, by friends uh, uh, to come stay with them because uh, I live in uh, like on the high floor. So in case of alert, I would have to go downstairs uh, many floors down. Uh, that didn't seem like a very rational idea. So I'm staying here with them in a private house. So in case uh, we do hear the alert, we just go down the basement, which is, takes us just 30 seconds. We are getting more and more used to that, uh, and that is uh, scary, and yet at the same time, it's becoming kind of a routine. So we just know that we hear the alert, we go down the basement, we don't hear the alert, we just keep on working. And what about as an MP? Your position must put you at greater risk. Have you been advised on what to do if Russian troops get close? Well, we were provided with weapons, uh, which is, uh, again, as someone told me a week ago that I would have uh, a weapon. I would not believe it that because I'm so much uh, not in favor of just uh, just having too much weapons on the street. Uh, but we were provided weapons. We were provided uh, with instructions what to do uh, in case we are in direct danger. Uh, but frankly speaking, I do not see myself uh, as of now in greater danger than, than regular folks on the street uh, or particularly than people in Kharkiv. I've been talking to the Russian Member of Parliament, Evgeny Popov. I asked him what he made of Russia targeting civilians in Ukraine. Our military is uh, going to destroy just military infrastructure. That's the first answer. But uh, you know that all last eight years, people in Donbass was under the Ukrainian artillery and uh, we have uh, 15,000 killed uh, people in Lugansk and Donetsk. We have. Uh, Can I just clarify before we go any further? That when we have a, a hospital shelled and a university shelled, those are military targets, are they? Mm. 
we have to confirm every information we got from Ukraine. If I'm you see it for you. I'm looking hospital. at it at Reuters now. No, 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 no. If you see a hospital, it doesn't mean that Russian military was attacked it. It can be Ukrainian military. It can so be the Ukrainians mistake. are killing themselves. Okay, just give me a second if you're giving me that flaw. Because uh, uh, you don't want to hear on us. Uh, you don't understand Russians. You don't understand people in uh, Lugansk and Donetsk. Let me ask you about the economic sanctions and everyday life in Moscow. Sure. Um, Western mm -hmm. countries are levying economic sanctions uh, on Russia. Are you seeing the impact of those sanctions in your everyday life? We we now in a tough time. But look at the uh, oil prices right now. Look at the gas prices right now. Nobody will uh, be in an easy life uh, in the next few months. Uh, and uh, years, of course, because uh, British people, American people, European people uh, will uh, 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 will will be uh, will face some restrictions uh, because uh, you will not afford your uh, energy uh, so sooner or later uh, because it's too high prices right now, and of course the world is global. We are not uh, in a, like in an island. We are the huge, hugest country in the world. Yes, we have a small but tough economy. We have a strong and stable economy. Of course, uh, um, it's going to be some difficulties for our people, and uh, they will feel it uh, sooner or later. Let but, me ask you but, about the uh, uh, protests that we've seen in Moscow. We've seen thousands of people on the streets of uh, both Moscow. Uh, and St. Petersburg. Uh, are you able to judge and quantify how substantial that domestic opposition is to this war in Russia? First, uh, I can be, can't be against my people in Russia. We are united in Russia. First. Uh, the second one. Uh, have you seen thousands on the street? Have you seen thousands? Tell me, tell me the city when you, you've seen thousands. It's a lie. It's a direct lie. So there are no protests uh, in course. Russia, that's what you're saying? Of course, of course. Uh, we have many people who is uh, against the war. Uh, I can tell you even more. Uh, all people in Russia are against the war. But, but... Now, we can negotiate with Ukraine people and uh, 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 Ukraine politicians and Ukraine uh, officials. I and you know that uh, in the evening we will see another round of negotiations. And uh, the first demand, uh, it's my personal opinion, should be ceasefire and humanitarian corridors. Is anyone around President Putin saying the way it is, or is he, do you think, surrounded by lots of uh, nodding acolytes? Oh, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know who is around the, uh, our president, who is his, like, um, close circle. But we have government, we have parliament, we have uh, senate, we have people, we have civil society, we have uh, 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 different opinions in our country. But, uh, uh, and of course, uh, our power should uh, hear uh, all, all, uh, all flanks of opinions. Ukraine is pushing to have its application to join the European Union fast-tracked as the Russian invasion continues. The membership of the EU is a process that normally takes years and requires support from all other EU members, something it doesn't yet have. Our correspondent Rebecca Bunden reports now from Brussels. As Russian troops push deeper into Ukraine, Ukraine is pushing to become a member of the European Union. It has already won a lot of support for its bid after it signed its application on Monday. 
It will be up to us as Europeans to rise to the occasion. We know it's a difficult subject because it touches on EU enlargement. We know there are different opinions. Poland, Czech Republic and Slovakia are among the EU countries that are backing Ukraine to gain swift entry as a candidate for membership. But others have expressed concerns. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte has said it is not a good discussion to have at this point in time. Ultimately, all the 27 member states of the European Union will have to give the green light for Ukraine's application to be successful. And normally it's by no means an easy or fast process to join the bloc. North Macedonia became a candidate for EU membership in 2005 and it's still navigating its way through the process. There are also many criteria that would need to be met. Analysts say that Ukraine would need to introduce more curbs on corruption, for example. Working in its favour, Ukraine already has very close relations with the EU. It signed an association agreement with the bloc in 2017 and it's a member of the EU's Eastern Partnership Policy. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says Ukraine and its president Vladimir Zelensky have the Commission's full support. When we last spoke, he told me again about his people's dream to join our union. Today, the European Union and Ukraine are already closer than ever before. There is still a long path ahead. We have to end this war and we should talk about the next steps. But even if Ukraine can go through a special fast-track process and win the approval of all the EU's member states, this will not be a solution to the country's most immediate problems. Rebecca Bunden, CGTN, Brussels. The International Paralympic Committee has announced Russian and Belarusian athletes will be allowed to compete in the Winter Games in Beijing, which start this week. But athletes will have to compete under a neutral flag and will be excluded from the medal table. We do have to follow the rules of our own organization uh, under the risk of having our uh, decisions overturned. We cannot, we don't have the authority to ban the Russian and Belarus athletes, uh, but the General Assembly has. That's why we are calling an extraordinary General Assembly to do that. Ukraine has raised close to $300 million at its first bond auction to raise funds to fight the Russian invasion. That's according to Ukraine's finance ministry. The government said it hoped to raise around $1.3 billion through the issue of new war bonds. It's one of a number of measures to raise money for the country's military defense and civilians facing displacement. Russia's largest lender, Sberbank, is quitting almost all European markets in the wake of Western sanctions. The bank said large cash outflows and threats to its staff and property meant it had no choice but to withdraw. It comes after the European Central Bank ordered the closure of Sberbank Europe. The United States is closing its airspace to Russian aircraft. President Joe Biden made the announcement during his State of Union address. It follows a similar move by Canada and the European Union. Biden also vowed to go after Russian oligarchs in retaliation for the invasion of Ukraine. The impact from the attack on Ukraine is global and Japan is feeling the squeeze from higher oil prices. The country is pretty much dependent on energy imports and a weakening yen is threatening its economic recovery. Phoebe Amoroso reports from Tokyo. In Japan, people are feeling the pinch as petrol prices head higher. It's really affecting me. Petrol is getting really expensive. My family uses the car a lot, so I'm strongly noticing the price rise. I think petrol prices are going up, so I hope the government is considering their policies regarding taxes and asset management. Global oil prices were already rising as COVID-19 cases began to fall last year. Now there are fears Russia could cut supplies to countries that have imposed sanctions, including Japan. The country produces little of its own energy and relies heavily on imports. That makes it highly vulnerable to market fluctuations. The Tokyo Core Consumer Price Index jumped 0.5% in February from a year earlier, a rise that exceeded market expectations. The main driver? A spike in energy prices of more than 24%. It's weighing heavily on people in Japan. We found the average household would end up spending almost $500 more this year, but our data is from January and includes the stimulus. 
Now that the situation is worsening, there will be a sudden jump in the commodity market. So we expect the burden on households to become even greater given the conflict. The surge in prices is expected to hit domestic consumption, just as Japan's economy continues to battle the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. A Reuters poll of analysts slashed Japan's growth forecast for the first quarter to an annualized 0.4%, down from a 4.5% expansion predicted last month. To ease the burden, the government began subsidizing oil wholesalers earlier this year, and it plans to sharply raise the subsidy limit next week. But that may still not be enough to help the economy. All the government can really do at the moment is raise subsidies at the distribution level to try and keep retail petrol prices down. But that comes out of public finances, so the costs will still be passed on to people in the end. It won't solve the underlying problem. International Energy Agency member countries, including Japan, will release 60 million barrels of oil from their emergency reserves. But the move has failed to calm the market, with oil prices surging to their highest since 2014. Phoebe Amoroso, CGTN, Tokyo. People living in some communities along Australia's east coast are being told it's too late to leave their homes. Extreme weather is dropping record amounts of rain across two states, submerging entire towns. Greg Navarro has the story. For every person lucky enough to get plucked off of their roofs, dozens more were forced to wait. We are totally and utterly exhausted. We've been standing in water up to my armpits for hours. Rescue crews trying to respond to the thousands of calls for help have been hampered by record-breaking rainfall. Up to 50 people and a few horses were stranded on this bridge overnight before being rescued. The extreme weather system hammering parts of Queensland and New South Wales is producing what one meteorologist described as astronomical amounts of rain. I've been living here for nearly 30 years and I've never seen it like this. This is unbelievable. Hundreds of millimetres of rain, enough to overwhelm rivers and creeks, quickly submerge homes and towns and knock out power for tens of thousands of people. Yeah, I live in South, I've never seen it like this ever. Like it's in our second story and it's never done that. Some areas have received more rainfall in just four days than what Sydney would normally receive in an entire year. Added on to that, just how saturated the ground already is because the East Coast summer has been dominated by a La Nina climate event, typically associated with greater rainfall for the second straight year. We must all prepare ourselves for the possibility that lives have been lost. Whilst I would love to think, and, and I truly hope, uh, that we will not see any deaths from this event, uh, I think that it is unrealistic uh, that a disaster of this magnitude will mean that there are no lives lost. By early Wednesday, nearly a dozen people were confirmed dead and dozens more still unaccounted for. I'm waiting for my parents and my, yeah, my mum, my brother, my dad and two dogs to come out from South Bismarck. Hundreds of evacuation centres have been set up, many filled with people who've lost everything. I feel like it's safe. <laughs> we lost the cars, the whole lot. We couldn't afford the flood insurance here. The extent of the damage <laughs> is tough to comprehend. In the New South Wales town of Lismore, volunteers arrived with anything that floats to rescue people and animals, including a group of Fijian workers who helped evacuate all residents from an elderly care center. Back in our home in Fiji, it's normal. We used to help each other like this. The massive weather system is slowly moving south towards Sydney, prompting flood warnings extending all the way to the Victorian border. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Sydney. The headlines again. Russia's invasion of Ukraine enters its seventh day. The Russians claim to have taken Kherson, the first city to fall to Moscow. Russian diplomats say they're ready to hold a second round of peace talks, and Ukraine confirms their delegation will participate. The United Nations says more than 800,000 people have now fled the fighting in Ukraine. And that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on Smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app and in the UK on Freebie. 
coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Goodbye.